Alrighty, here we are again. This is Tony Denton coming to you from Little Rock, Arkansas on Saturday, May 23rd, 2020. We're on installment number 13 of 14 of my audiobook of my book called James from Persecuted to Perfected Fulfilled. Thank you for being with me again today. And we're looking at chapter 5 of James verses 7 through 12. That begins on page 119 of the book if you have a copy of my book. And if you do have a copy, you will probably notice a mistake on the title. On your book, it probably says James 5, 1 through 12. Somehow I typoed that. It should have been 7 through 12 because we did verses 1 through 6 in our last installment. Anyway, I fixed it on my file, but it's not fixed for the use of sales yet, so... Anyway, I'll try and get that taken care of as soon as I'm through going through the book and being sure I don't find something else, which should happen in the next couple of weeks. Well, it's a rainy day again today, as it has been practically every day, seems like, since we moved here. And it's supposed to rain practically every day next week. But I'm going to be inside here most of the time working on several things like these audios. So I'll just stay out of it, I guess. If I get out... I get stuck in the mud, just walking to the mailbox. Anyway, so if you're ready for me now, page 119 of the book, James 5, 7 through 12, I've determined to call this section Determination. James was still addressing the suffering saints when he wrote to be patient. This was his advice at the opening of the letter in the first chapter, verse 4, and now again at the close of the letter, chapter 5, verse 7. Since God wasn't going to right all the wrongs in their world, they had to learn how to patiently endure all their hardships and heartaches, at least until he removed the worst ones when he brought down their Jewish persecutors. After all, Jesus himself very plainly warned his followers that they'd have tribulation, John 16:33, for since they persecuted him, they would also persecute them, his followers, John 15, verse 20. It's interesting to note that James used two different Greek words for patience. The word for patience in verses 7 through 10 refers to being long-tempered or long-suffering, with special reference to people, such as the rich persecutors of verses 4 through 6, and confer that with chapter 1, 3, and 4. And the word for patience or perseverance in verse 11 refers to the ability of holding out under great pressure and stress with special reference to circumstances. In other words, this latter word had to do with a determination to stay put and stand fast when they'd much rather run away. So again, the first word, verses 7 through 10, refers to long-suffering with reference to people. The second word in verse 11 refers to long-suffering with reference to circumstances. So regardless of their pressures and their stresses and persecutions or whatever it was that was in their way of living a nice, smooth, stress-free life, they were to put up with it. They were to be patient about it and long-suffering concerning it. Well, in the text under consideration now, chapter 5, 7 through 12, James illustrated how the recipients of his letter could have patient endurance by use of three examples, the farmer, the prophets, and Job. So, James first wanted them to consider the farmer. Brethren, be patient, not till death. He didn't say not till death. He said, be patient till the presence of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he gets the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the presence of the Lord has drawn near. Confer page 4 about that. Don't be groaning against one another, brethren, so that you won't be judged. Behold, the judge is standing before the doors. Those brethren back then knew that if a person were impatient, then he had better not become a farmer, unless he wanted to build up his patience. Why? Most notably because they knew the farmer couldn't control the weather. Too much rain, and I know about that, could cause the crop to rot. Too much sun could burn it up and an early frost would easily kill it. So the farmer had to be extremely tolerant of the weather. Besides, he must have to have patience with the seed and the crop due to the time it took plants to grow. 
In Palestine, the early rain came in autumn to soften the soil for planting and to water the seed, while the latter rain, or the late rain as I have it here, came in spring to mature the crop for harvesting. So the farmer had to wait several weeks for his seed to produce fruit. Now, why did the farmer willingly wait so long? Because the fruit was considered precious, James said. In other words, the harvest was well worth waiting for. Paul wrote, In due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart, Galatians 6 verse 9, which fits right in with the idea of expectation behind the Greek word James chose for waits. In the same vein, Jesus said, The earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come, Mark 4, 28 29. So to be a farmer, one had to have bushels of patience. James pictured those first generation Christians as spiritual farmers, looking for a spiritual or eternal harvest. James said, be patient and establish your hearts. Their hearts were the soil. The seed was the word of God, Luke 8, 11. And there were seasons to their spiritual journey, just as there were seasons to their literal soil. Sometimes their hearts would become cold and wintry, so the Lord had to plow them up before he could cultivate the seed. He sent the sun and the rain of his goodness to water and nurture the seeds, depending on them to be patient like the proverbial farmer. So, it was the secret to their endurance when the going got tough. God was producing a harvest in them. He wanted the work of the Holy Spirit to find fulfillment in their purification, thereby maturing them and thus corporately making them a sanctified bride for his son, conferred Ephesians 5:21 and following. And the only way he could accomplish that task was through trials and troubles, confer Hebrews 12, 1 and following. So instead of growing impatient with God, they needed to yield to him, permitting the fruit of the Spirit to grow in them because they were spiritual farmers looking for an eternal harvest. They could enjoy a great harvest if only their hearts were established, verse 8, which meant that they've been tried and found true, that is, grounded in the Lord. So instead of making their hearts fat, as the rich were doing, verse 5, they need to be making themselves lean, that is, firm or resolute. Paul not only prayed for the Christians in Thessalonica that they might be grounded, 1 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 13, but he also sent Timothy to ground them in their faith, 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 3, which taught them that God's word and prayer were essential if their hearts were going to be established. The simple fact was that a heart that wasn't proven and stable just would not be part of the fruit to soon be harvested. They also needed to keep in mind that, like the earthly farmer, the spiritual farmer didn't stand around doing nothing. He was constantly at work as he awaited the harvest. James didn't tell these suffering servants to put on white robes, climb a mountain, and wait for Jesus. Rather, he admonished them to keep working and waiting. Jesus said, Blessed is a servant whom his master will find doing when he comes, or working when he comes, Luke 12, 43, which reminds me of a slogan I read that one church adopted. Wake up, sing up, preach up, pray up, and pay up, but never give up, or let up, or back up, or shut up until the cause of Christ in the church and in the world is built up. One more point is that the farmer, especially the spiritual farmer, wasn't one to get into fights with his neighbors, verse 9. One of the usual marks of farmers was their willingness to help each other. Good and busy farmers just couldn't afford to use their time and energy squabbling. I think James was saying that impatience with God often leads to impatience with his people or blaming others for their miseries, and this was a sin they must avoid. If they started using their sickles on each other, they'd miss the good and true harvest. Now, before we move on to the second point, I need to add something in here. It's not in my book. I noticed as I was reading through this for you on this audio book that I missed bringing up James 1, 18. Going back to James chapter 1 again. See, so you, you know, you got the bookends. James introduced a lot of ideas in chapter 1 that he went on to talk about through the next four chapters. Well, in chapter 1, verse 18, what did he bring up? He brought up the idea of the people to whom he wrote being, what? First fruits. 
See how that fits in with his talk about there being spiritual farmers here in chapter 5? Surely you can see that. They were the first fruits, and they were looking for a harvest, which was, according to James chapter 5, 7 through 11, about to occur. It would obviously be in their lifetime, which brings me to a second point that I need to emphasize, and that is for you to go back to my introduction in my book on James and read the section about James chapter 5, where I had to introduce the book by talking about James chapter 5 because of the importance of seeing it as a book of eminency, a book dealing with what was going to happen to them very soon, and if they were to be preparing for that which is why James provided them with so much practical teaching and information about how they were to live during their time of waiting for the coming of the Lord, referred to in chapter 5, 7 through 9. Again, it was imminent upon them. Okay, secondly, James wanted them to consider the prophets. Brethren, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of the suffering of evil and the exercise of patience. Verse 10. Jesus also used the prophets as an example of victory over persecution. Matthew 5 verse 12. These prophets or witnesses, Hebrews 12 verse 1, who've been through some of the same things our first generation brethren were going through, those to whom James wrote, gave them, or at least should have given them, great encouragement in at least three ways. Number one, although they were in the will of God, they suffered. They were preaching in the name of the Lord, yet they were persecuted. The enemy, who was, in this case, primarily if not totally, referring to the persecuting, Christ-rejecting Jews, were telling these faithful Christians, who were Jews, but had left Judaism for Christianity, that their sufferings were the result of their unfaithfulness, kind of like what Job's so-called friends told him. And yet the faithful Christians' sufferings might actually have been because of faithfulness. Paul said, all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. So they were to never think that obedience automatically produced ease and pleasure. For even our Lord's obedience, which was impeccable, led him to the cross. So this goes against the whole idea that a lot of churches teach concerning the health and wealth business, you know. Number two. The prophets taught them that God cared for them when they were going through the sufferings that were for his sake. Elijah declared to wicked King Ahab that there'd be a drought in the land for three and a half years, and Elijah himself had to suffer through that drought. But God cared for him and gave him victory over the evil priests of Baal. It has rightly been said that the will of the Lord doesn't lead his people where his grace can't keep them. And number three... Many prophets had to endure great sufferings, not only at the hands of unbelievers, but also at the hands of believers. Jeremiah was arrested as a traitor and even thrown into an abandoned well to die. By whom? His own people, the Jews, God's people, quote unquote. At another time, God fed Jeremiah and protected him throughout an awful siege on Jerusalem, even though at times it looked as if he was going to be killed. Both Ezekiel and Daniel had their share of hardships, but the Lord delivered them. And even those who weren't delivered, those who died for their faith, received God's special reward for those who were true to him to the point of death. Confer Revelation 2 verse 10. So why is it that those who spoke in the name of the Lord so often endured difficult trials? They did so in order that their lives might support their messages. The impact of a faithful, godly life carried a great deal of power. This example that James used from the Old Testament prophets then was meant to encourage those brethren to spend more time in Scripture, getting acquainted with those heroes of faith. For whatever things were written before were written for their learning, that they through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, Paul wrote in Romans 15.4. See, the better they knew the Word, the more God could encourage them in their difficult times. The important thing was that, like the farmer, they kept working. And like the prophets, they kept preaching, no matter how trying the circumstances may have been. And thirdly, James wanted them to consider Job. So, the farmer, the prophets, and now Job. Look, we count them blessed who are enduring. You've heard of the perseverance of Job, and you've seen the lesson the Lord provided that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. 
But above all, my brethren, stop swearing either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no, so that you might not fall under judgment, verses 11 and 12. Proverbially, just as there can be no victories without battles and no peaks without valleys, so there can be no perseverance without trials. If they want to be blessed, verse 11, then they have to be prepared to carry burdens and fight battles. Why? Because God balances rights with responsibilities and blessings with burdens. Otherwise, they become nothing but spoiled brats. Something else important to remember is that, although it's true they might have been experiencing a blessing in the midst of trials, as the three Hebrew children did in the furnace, James taught them that there was a blessing after they had endured as well. And his example was Job. The book of Job is a lengthy book, the chapters being filled with speeches that to us today seem very long and tedious. In chapters 1 through 3, there's Job's distress. He lost health, wealth, and family, except for his wife, who was just a tool against him. In chapters 4 through 31, there's Job's defense. He debated with his three friends, quote-unquote, answering their false accusations, after which there was a long speech by Elihu in chapters 32 through 37. Then, in chapters 38 through 42, there's Job's deliverance. First, God humbled him, and then he honored him, giving him twice as much as he had before. By the way, I think the point of James to his readers was to stop emphasizing Job's endurance of suffering and begin emphasizing his blessings for enduring those sufferings. In studying the experience of Job, it's important to recall that Job didn't understand what was going on behind the scenes between God and his enemy, the Satanas. Job's friends accused him of being a sinner and a hypocrite. There must be some terrible sin in your life, they argued, or God would never have permitted this suffering. But Job disagreed with them, maintaining his innocence during the entire conversation. But his friends were wrong. God had no cause against Job, chapter 2, verse 3, and in the end God rebuked the friends for telling lies to and about Job, chapter 42, verse 7. It's difficult to find a greater example of suffering than Job. Circumstances were against him. He lost his health and wealth, and he lost his beloved children. Even his wife turned against him, saying, Curse God and die, chapter 2, verse 9. His friends were against him. They accused him of hypocrisy, so he deserved misery, chapter 4. And it even seemed like God was against him. When Job cried out for answers to his questions, there was no reply from heaven, chapters 13 and 14. Yet through all this, Job endured. His enemy predicted that he'd get impatient enough to abandon his faith, but he didn't. It's true that Job questioned God, but Job didn't forsake his faith. Rather, he said, though he slay me, yet I will trust him, chapter 13, verse 15. By the way, why did Job's friends react the way they did? Because they thought like the Israelites later did. I, in fact, believe that the story of Job, perhaps as a living parable like Hosea, is the story of national Israel from their beginning to their ending, their ending being with the Messiah and being blessed with more than they ever had before. But anyway, with that aside, because God made a covenant with Israel that he would bless them if they'd obey his law, Deuteronomy 11, this led to the mistaken notion that if someone was wealthy and comfortable, then he was blessed of God because he was righteous. But if someone was poor and suffering, then he was cursed of God because he was unrighteous. Even the apostles thought like this. When Jesus said it was difficult for rich men to enter heaven, the disciples were shocked and asked, Who then can be saved? Matthew 19, 23-26. The rich are especially blessed by God, they were saying. So if they don't make it, no one will. The book of Job refutes that idea because Job was a righteous man who suffered. In fact, that's what we're told at the very beginning of the book, where God points to Job for his enemy, the Satanas, and says, look at my man Job. He was righteous. So one of the main lessons we learn from the book of Job, and thus James, is that God had a higher purpose in their suffering than punishment for sin. For example, in Job's case, what was the end intended by the Lord? Well, it was to reveal that the Lord is full of mercy and compassion, verse 11. But someone may argue, if God is so merciful, why didn't he protect Job from all that suffering to begin with? Well, although only God can fully answer that question, yet there are at least three things that come to mind. A. God was glorified, conferred James 5, verse 11. B. Job was purified, conferred James 1, verse 4, as well as being strengthened and blessed. 
And who knows? C. Maybe Job's experience eventually had a profound effect on his wife. The thing to remember is that long-suffering always has a goal for what it strives. So what did Job's story mean to the Christians James addressed? Well, it meant that some, perhaps even most, of their trials were caused directly by opposition from their enemy, God's enemy. God permitted their satanos to test his children, but he always limited the extent of his power. So when they found themselves in the fire, they needed to remember that God was keeping his gracious hand on the thermostat, conferred Job 1.12, Job 2.6, and 1 Corinthians 10.13 by the Apostle Paul. See, what their enemy was doing and would do in their near future would push the boundaries of their patience with their accepted Messiah, for an impatient Christian was a powerful weapon. The impatience of Moses robbed him of his entrance into the Holy Land. Abraham's impatience led to the birth of Ishmael, the enemy of the Jews, and Peter's impatience nearly made him a murderer. When the enemy attacked them, it was easy for them to get impatient, run ahead of God, and lose his blessing as a result. So what was the answer? Jesus said, My grace is sufficient, 2 Corinthians 12, 7-10. And remember, Paul said that his thorn in the flesh was from Satanos, the enemy, his enemy, and therefore God's enemy, verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He could have fought it, given up under it, or denied its existence, but he didn't. Instead, he trusted God for the grace he needed, and through prayer and determination, he turned the enemy's weapon into a tool for building up the church and for his own spiritual life. So now the question regarding James 5.12 is, how did this directive of James about taking oaths fit in with the problem of suffering? Well, if you've ever suffered, you probably know the answer. It's easy for humans to say things they don't mean and even make bargains with God when they're going through difficulties. Let's go back to Job for an example. Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong, Job 1, 21-22. Job did curse the day he was born, chapter 3, 1-19, through 19, but he never cursed God as his wife told him to do, nor did he speak a foolish oath. And he also never did try to bargain with God. Besides that, I'm certain that James meant to remind our first generation brethren of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 34-37. See, the Jews were great ones for using various oaths to back up their statements. However, they avoided using God's name in their oaths because rabbinic tradition taught that such oaths could be violated without committing perjury, like when we cross our fingers. So they'd swear by heaven or earth or Jerusalem or even by their own heads. But Jesus taught the impossibility of avoiding God in oaths. Heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool, and Jerusalem was his city. See, the thing was and is, true Christian character requires few words, and James dealt with that in at least two places in his letter, chapter 1, 19 and 20, and chapter 3, 1 through 12. The person who must use many words, including oaths, to convince a person of some statement has something wrong with his character, so he feels he must support his weakness by using many words and promises. Yes, to promise is to swear. However, if they have true integrity, then all they had to say was yes or no, and that would have been enough. Jesus warned that anything more than this is associated with evil. The primary purpose of their suffering was to purify them as the Lord's betrothed, meaning not only that they'd be sanctified, but also they'd come out with better character. Certainly Job was a better man for having gone through the furnace, especially doing so without swearing or cursing. When Peter poured out those oaths in the courtyard, Matthew 26, 71, he was giving evidence that his character was still in need of some transformation. So instead of following Peter, those brethren should have concentrated on being like the prophets who, even when they were being mistreated, continued to speak as, quote, in the Lord, unquote. Well, reviewing chapter 5, 7 through 12, we see that, in conclusion, James wanted to encourage his first century brethren to have a patient determination in times of suffering. Like the farmer, they were to work while patiently enduring hardships until God gave the increase, that is, until the harvest. Like the prophets, they were to preach while patiently enduring affliction until God vindicated them. And like Job, they were to persevere while patiently enduring suffering until God fulfilled his purpose in and through them, thus creating the church which brought in the kingdom. That's something, of course, talked about in some of my other talks, but I wanted to add that little part in there for you. Another way of looking at this passage is through two positive commands 
and two negative commands on how they were to get through such tribulation as the poor were having to deal with, verse 4. Be patient, verse 7, and stand firm, verse 8. Don't complain, verse 9, and don't swear, verse 12. So there you have it. Pages 119 through 128 of my book, chapter 5, 7 through 12, being talked about some on these pages. And I hope you found a little bit of information there that's useful to you. At least a couple of nuggets of truth or something helpful in your spiritual life and in your understanding of the Word of God, the Word of James, the great brother of Jesus. Thank you for being with me today on this short study. And we will try and finish up my book next week with chapter 5, 13 through 20.